Okay, we're going to start and we're going to talk about uh, acute cardiac. And one of the things that we're going to do, first of all, is kind of review some of the terminology so that when we start talking about various um, uh, medications and how they affect different um, areas of the body and different, you know, functions of the cardiovascular system, we understand what we're talking about. So who can tell me in one sentence what does systole mean? The top. A little bit more in depth than that, thank you. Right, it indicates that the heart is contracting. It's the pressure of the blood that's being ejected from the heart into the pulmonary circulation or the peripheral, the systemic, the emptying of the atria and the ventricle. So that is systole. What is diastole? When the ventricles and the atria relax. And also, during diastole, a lot of very important things happen. First of all, the, the um, ventricles passively fill with blood from the atria. And also during diastole, the coronary arteries are being perfused. The oxygenated blood is going into those coronary arteries. And that's what feeds and nourishes our myocardium, right? So if we have, when we start talking about dysrhythmias later, a very rapid dysrhythmia where the time for diastole is shortened, what's happening to our myocardium? It's not getting enough blood. It's not getting what it should in terms of oxygenated blood. Heart rate. What's the heart rate? Beats per minute. What is stroke volume? The volume of blood ejected from the left ventricle during each beat. The normal is about 70 milliliters for an adult. What's the normal heart rate for an adult? 60 to 100. What's your cardiac output? Heart rate times stroke volume. So it's the number of beats per minute times the number of milliliters per contraction gives you the volume of blood that is being ejected by the heart over one minute. That's your cardiac output. Very important concept to understand because a lot of coronary artery disease and uh, coronary diseases that we're going to talk about um, specifically have their ca the cardiac output affected. And there's a whole mess of things that can go wrong when you don't have good cardiac output. Such as, well, there's certain things that cardiac output is going to be influenced by. Who can tell me what preload is? The pressure generated in the ventricles at the end of diastole kind of really doesn't tell you a whole lot, right? But if you think of it as the volume of blood that's coming back to the right side of the heart from the body, that's preload. So if you have increased preload, you've got a lot of blood volume coming back to the heart. And so that can cause some problems when we start talking about functional issues with the heart. It can cause the right, the right atrium and the right ventricle to stretch or become tired out and weakened because it just can't pump that volume. Because the more blood volume that comes back to the heart each minute from the periphery means more work for the heart. What is afterload? Right, so think of afterload as resistance. The resistance that the left ventricle has to pump against to get its blood out to the rest of the body. So if you have an increased afterload, a higher level of resistance, that's going to make that left ventricle work harder. Contractility, what does that mean? That's the ability of the heart to do what? To contract. So if we have good contractility, then we've got good cardiac output. If we've got a weakened myocardium, weakened and, and lessened contractility, then you're not going to get good cardiac output. Rhythmicity, what does that mean? Right, the regularity of the heart rate. If you have a nice regular heart rate at the correct number of beats per minute, between 60 and 100 for adults, then you're going to have good cardiac output. If you have a tacky or bradydysrhythmia, fast or slow, where diastole is shortened or the amount of beats per minute makes the cardiac output decrease, you're not going to get as good cardiac output and that's going to affect what's happening in the rest of the body. What is ejection fraction? Right. 
Right. It is the, actually the percentage of blood that is pumped out of the ventricles during contraction with each heartbeat. Because our ventricles do not totally empty every time they contract. So the normal percentage is 55 to 70 percent ejection fraction. That's the amount of blood that is pumped out of the ventricle to go to the body. So that patient with congestive heart failure you'll see an ejection fraction of 25 or 30 percent. That means a lot less blood is getting pumped out into the periphery. How are we going to, what, what test, can you remember what test it is that helps to determine? An echocardiogram is one of the tests where we'll, we can find out what that ejection fraction is. So all of these preload the volume of blood coming back to the heart from the body. Afterload, the resistance that the heart has to pump against to get blood out of it into the body. Contractility, the ability, the strength of contraction. Rhythmicity, the regularity of the heart rate is all going to affect how your cardiovascular, how your cardiac output um, is going to be. So now we're going to talk about our cardiovascular assessment. So just like with the respiratory, we talked about history and, and questions. What questions are you going to ask for that patient that's coming in with cardiovascular or cardiac issues? Smokers, sleep patterns, occupation, activity, diet, family history, because a lot of cardiac history is, is familial, a lot of cardiac issues, allergies, foods, latex, anesthesia, when did, when did your pain or your cardiac symptoms start, what precipitated them, what helps? what doesn't help, your level of fatigue. Questioning that patient about how their ADLs are, how, you know, do you get more tired when you take a shower in the morning than you used to? Does it take you longer to eat because you get short of breath while you're eating? Do you have problems, you know, talk, having a conversation because you get short of breath after only a few words? Has this ever happened before and is it similar? Right, has it happened before? Is it similar? What helped in the past? And maybe why isn't it helping? Is it still helping? And, and it's going to be a concern if it's not helping now. And then, um, so that history of present illness um, <clears throat> is a lot of that, that particular type of um, assessment in history. What, you, when ter what in terms of your physical assessment are you going to be looking for? Hmm? Edema. Hmm? What are the six P's? Right, so, and what does that tell you? That tells you how well what? How well, their, how well their heart is working, how the tissue is perfused. Are they having chest pain? And asking the patient to describe that chest pain. Don't put words in their mouth. It's amazing the things that they'll say to you in their description of their chest pain. Um, apical heart rate. Listening for, you know, murmurs, friction rubs, S1 and S2 sounds that we're going to talk about a little bit. What other signs, what other things do you look at when you're, when you're doing your cardiac assessment? JVD. What is that going to indicate? Right-sided heart failure, blood flow into the uh, JVD, uh, into the peripheral circulation. Uh, what else? Capillary refill. Right. Their, 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 um, their expression, are, are they anxi do they have anxiety? Um, are they grimacing? Are they showing any nonverbal signs of pain? Um, their lung sounds. Uh, their pulse ox. Clubbing, which is going to indicate long-term issues with oxygenation and perfusion. Oops, oh, I have to get that down here because this we're talking about CAD. And it says, yes, that was very loud, Mr. Trainer, but I said I wanted to hear your heart. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, what is coronary artery disease? What's the definition of coronary artery disease? What's that? It can be hardening, but as a general definition, 
Right, so anytime there's a narrowing or occlusion of the coronary arteries, it's considered coronary artery disease. So arteriosclerosis is defined as what? The thickening or hardening of the arteries, the narrowing of those arteries. And atherosclerosis is what? Is when there's plaque. There's substances, clots, plaque, something that's narrowing the lumen of the artery because of deposits of other stuff. So arteriosclerosis, stiffening and narrowing and hardening of the arteries. Um, atherosclerosis, occlusion because of plaque. So we have various risk factors. And when we talk about modifiable risk factors, you need to understand what modifiable truly means. Because, and really, it's, are they risk factors that we can control or regulate? Not necessarily change or eliminate. A lot of people think modify means that, that you know, I can change this, I can eliminate it. Well, oftentimes you can't change or eliminate that risk factor, but you can control it and regulate it so that it doesn't get, it, it reduces your risk of getting coronary artery disease. So the non-modifiable ones, things we can't change. Can't change our age. So even if you get, you know, uh, liposuction and get your, you know, face done and your nose job um, and hair plugs, the whole bit, you can't change how old you are. I'm sorry. Gender. Even if you have a sex change operation, chromosomally, you will remain either a male or a female. And there are certain risk factors based on whether or not you are male or female. Race. You cannot, you know, they say you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. You cannot change your race or ethnicity. And there's certain, uh, <laughs> but he still didn't change his risk factors. <laughs> Because those, those are things you cannot change, and there are certain ethnic groups that are, uh, have a higher propensity and risk factor for coronary artery disease. Family history. You can, again, you cannot pick your family. I mean, you, can't, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. So those are the non-modifiable risk factors. The modifiable ones are on the right-hand side of that slide. You can modify your diabetes. You can't change the fact that you have diabetes frequently. If you have type 1 diabetes, you can't change the fact that your pancreas isn't working. But if you control your glucose levels, you reduce your risks of coronary artery disease because it's the spikes in glucose that increase the risk. If you control your sugars, you can reduce your risk. Can't eliminate it, can't get rid of the diabetes, but it's modifiable in the sense that you can control and regulate it. Hypertension. You can control and regulate and modify your hypertension by medication, by diet, by exercise. You may always have to take medication. You can't, may not be able to eliminate the fact that you have the diagnosis of hypertension, but you can control and regulate it because the, the peaks of uh, the spikes in, in blood pressure are what cause damage to the coronary arteries. Smoking, obviously modifiable. Obesity and increased BMI. Very difficult to control, but, you know. <clears throat> if you have a BMI greater than 35%, it doubles and triples your risks of developing coronary artery disease and dying from coronary artery disease. So they look at that um, in terms of what they call the metabolic syndrome is what a lot of doctors are looking at now. Um, and if you have three of these issues that's considered an increased risk of coronary artery disease. If you have insulin resistance, glucose is greater than 100 on a consistent basis. Abdominal obesity gives you a higher risk. Triglycerides, dyslipidemia, so elevated triglycerides and, um, and um, LDLs. Hypertension. And if you have what they call the pro-inflammatory states, like elevated C-reactive protein or pro-thrombotic states, hypercoagulation, any three of those are considered part of that metabolic syndrome and increases your risk of coronary artery disease. <clears throat> Physical inactivity, obviously it's something you can modify. 
Now, prevention, medical and nursing management of coronary artery disease. The goals of treatment are to control your cholesterol, treat your hyperlipidemia, manage your hypertension, and control your diabetes. That takes care of a lot of the issues with that metabolic syndrome. So who knows what the difference is between HDL and LDL? Which is the good, which is the bad? HDL, HDL is the good. I like to call it the happy. Uh, the happy cholesterol and the LDL is the lousy cholesterol. And that's how I remember, you know, which is which because you would think HDL would be bad, you know, high, but anyway, it's not. So high HDL is the happy. So you need to have an HDL greater than 40 to 60. And depending on your risk level, if you have a very low risk, if your LDL is less than 160, you're doing okay. If you have a moderate risk, a couple of risk factors, you should be less than 130. If you already have coronary artery disease, you need to be less than 100. And if you are what is called very, very high risk, your LDL should be less than 70. Okay, statins. What do statins do? They lower LDL and triglycerides. And they do that by working on your liver. So patients with advanced liver disease um, shouldn't be on statins because they've already got a compromised liver function. And if you're on long-term statin therapy, you should have frequent liver function tests. You should be checked at least once a year. And certainly if you show any signs of, of liver dysfunction like jaundice or, or bruising, then you should definitely get your LDLs checked right away. I mean, your, uh, your LFTs checked right away. So statins have to be monitored. And how many patients have you seen that have probably been on Lipitor for years? And you wonder, you know, are, how often is there, are they really getting their labs done um, and being managed? And also diet. You know, if, if we're, you know, if we're doing low cholesterol disease, you know, low cholesterol foods, um, hopefully we can lower our LDLs by watching our diet. We need to monitor, we need to manage our hypertension, and we're going to talk about meds for that in a little bit. And we need to control our diabetes. It's the, it's the spikes in blood sugar that cause more damage to the coronary arteries. If we can control that glucose, even if we can't eliminate the diabetes, we can reduce our, um, our effects. So you have that slide for the diet therapy for atherosclerosis. So I don't need to read that to you. And now we're going to move into some of the coronary artery diseases and issues that we're going to be dealing with and, and how we differentiate what's going on with the patient. So angina, angi angina pectoris. Uh, what is the difference between stable and unstable? Right, so if you have stable angina, the only time you're going to get chest pain is when you do something. You have an activity that precipitates the chest pain. And then you either stop that activity and or take nitroglycerin, and the chest pain subsides. That is stable angina. Unstable angina, and some patients will go from having stable to unstable as their conditions deteriorate, that patient is going to get chest pain totally unrelated to any activity. They could just be sitting there, they could be sleeping, they could be doing nothing, and they get chest pain. But we know that it's angina when what? How do we treat it? We give nitro and the chest pain goes away, then we know it's angina. Because if we give them nitro and the chest pain doesn't go away, what do we know? Probably having a heart attack. So we can have what is called intractable angina, which is severe and incapacitating. Anything that's intractable, is, you know, intractable pain, intractable vomiting, is, is something that persists and is hard to control and, um, and doesn't respond well to treatment. Patients can have what is called variant angina. That's when they have an arterial spasm, pain at rest with an arterial spasm. Yes? Sorry. 
So, yeah. So, variant is when the pain, patient has pain at rest, and it's usually caused by an arterial spasm rather than the narrowing and, or the occlusion that we would normally see with, with angina. And patients can have a silent episode of angina. They don't feel any pain. So who can tell me what's the difference between ischemia and infarction? What does ischemia mean? Right, not enough oxygen getting to the myocardium or any tissue. You can have peripheral vascular or peripheral arterial ischemia. So you have pain as it relates to the oxygen supply that's insufficient to meet the needs of that particular organ. In this case, we're talking about the myocardium. How is that different from infarction? What is infarction? Infarction means actual tissue death because of lack of oxygen. So we have necrosis, tissue death when, it, when we're talking about infarction. And we talked about the assessment of chest pain, so I don't need to go over those. <coughs> yes, I jumped the gun, yes. Silent is when they, um, they've had issues with, with uh, decreased um, oxygen to the, blood, to the myocardium, but they don't feel any chest pain from it. So how do they feel? It'll, it'll usually show up on an EKG that there's been some myocardial damage, and the patient says, how could there be myocardial damage? I haven't experienced any chest pain. Well, they said at some point you, did, you had what is called silent angina. So now we're going to talk about some of the pharmacology. And how I usually talk about this when I, you know, is that some of these are going to be used uh, just for coronary artery disease. Some are going to be used for a lot of other things that we're going to talk about. So if I talk about them once, I'm not going to talk about them again when they are used in another disease process that we're talking about because there's no point in repeating myself, right? So nitrates. Uh, what, what are nitrates? What do they do? How do they come? Well, they, they're a vasodilator. So if, they, so if we have coronary artery disease, the nitrates will dilate the blood vessel, improve the oxygen, oxygenated blood flow to the myocardium. So they can be sublingual. How else can we give, it, give uh, nitro? Transdermal patch or paste by the inch. There's a teaching, box 14.3, um, in your book that all the teaching that you do with patients about um, angina, about uh, nitrates. Uh, it's box 14, colon 3, so it's in chapter 14 somewhere. 403? Okay, then we're going to talk about beta blockers and alpha blockers. First, we'll talk about beta blockers. What is an example or some of the beta blockers? Metoprolol. So the olols are your beta blockers. It's kind of a way to remember that. And what the beta blockers do is they block the sympathetic nervous system impulses at the level of the blood vessels. So what can you remember about what the sympathetic nervous system does to your blood vessels? What does it cause them to do? Constrict. To constrict. And it also causes your heart rate to go faster, right? That's that fight or flight. So if you're blocking those sympathetic nerve impulses, what's happening to your blood vessels? They're dilating. They're relaxing. And what else is what's happening to your heart rate? It's slowing down. So the beta blockers lower the blood pressure, improve myocardial perfusion by relaxing the blood vessels and slowing down the heart rate, lowering the blood pressure. Possibly, but it, it's not going to slow it down that much that at some point they're going to, because it doesn't completely block it, it slows down those impulses. Yeah, you know, because you're going to, it may take a little bit longer to get up to a target heart rate, but you will eventually get up there. Um, so, so you've got decreased heart rate, relaxation of the blood vessels, improved perfusion, lowering of the blood pressure. And so what are we going to teach patients that are on beta blockers? Stand up slowly, change position slowly. Alpha adrenergic blockers block the receptors on the blood vessels and cause vasodilation. 
And examples of some of the uh, alpha adrenergic blockers are the osins, like terazosin, and tamulosin, and docuzosin, doxa, doxazosin, excuse me. Now, terazosin is also known as hytrin. And hytrin is frequently prescribed for men of a certain age with enlarged prostates because it helps with their voiding issues and they're, they're dribbling and they're getting up in the middle of the night and all this other stuff. So some of your elderly male patients will be on hytrin prescribed by their urologist for their BPH. So that's part of that really thorough history, medical history, medication history that you do to make sure that the patient is telling his cardiologist what medications his urologist put him on. So the cardiologist doesn't go and start adding other antihypertensives to this patient without being aware of the fact that they're already on, for instance, an alpha adrenergic blocker like Hytrin for their uh, BPH. Calcium channel blockers, what do they do? And if somebody says blocks calcium channels, I'm <laughs> giving you a little more information than that. Right, so it decreases the conduction. It slows the movement of calcium from the, uh, between the cardiac cells and so that it slows down the conduction. Again, slows down the heart rate, relaxes the blood vessels, improves cardiac output. What's an example of a calcium channel blocker? Amlodipine. Norvasc, diltiazem, cardizem, very common calcium channel blocker that we use. So you've got a patient, and oftentimes, particularly certain ethnic groups, for instance, African Americans, require more than one antihypertensive to control their blood pressure. So your patient could be on a beta blocker and a calcium channel blocker. What do you think might be the problem with that? Because what do they both do? They relax the blood vessels, but what also do they do? slow the heart rate. So if you're giving those, that patient this medication, that you know you're giving it to them for their blood pressure, you need to check their heart rate as well. You know, you're always going to, when you give an antihypertensive, you're always going to check that heart rate right before, I mean the blood pressure right before you give it. Well, the same should be, you should also be checking their apical rate. Because uh, particularly if they're on a beta blocker and or a calcium channel blocker, both of which slow down your heart rate. And also for patients with coronary artery disease, they may be on antiplatelets or anticoagulants, Coumadin or Lovenox that we talked about this morning um, to prevent the formation of clots. So any question about the pharmacology so far? Okay, PCIs, percutaneous coronary interventions, various procedures that we're going to be doing for our patients uh, with coronary artery disease. The first is a cardiac calf and a PCTA, percutaneous, okay, I'm drawing, I'm drawing a total blank, percutaneous trans, transluminal coronary angioplasty, wow, and it's only one o'clock, that's pretty bad. Okay, so we talked about the pulmonary angiogram. What's a cardiac calf? It's a coronary angiogram, right? So what are we going to do pre-procedure? What are we going to ask them? Allergies. Um, the cannulation is usually the femoral artery. They thread it up, and in this time, they inject the dye into the coronary arteries. And so this particular patient, if they have that renal insufficiency, like I said this morning, they're going to, uh, I mean, if they, they have the renal insufficiency, they're still going to do this. If they have the allergy to shellfish, they're still going to do this. They're just going to load that patient up with antihistamines so that they don't have an allergic reaction. Um, and then they can go in with a balloon, a catheter with a balloon on it, and expand the balloon and depress and, and you know, make that plaque smoosh up against the uh, inside of the artery uh, so that it opens it up. So the cardiac cath is going to be a diagnostic to tell where the blockages are. The PCTA can be part of that cardiac cath um, as we go in and we do that balloon angioplasty that you hear about. And if the patient is at risk for reoccluding, either having spasms or more issues with plaque, then you could, they may place a stent 
in that coronary artery in order to keep it open so that it doesn't re -occlude. So what's our post-procedure care and what are some of the possible complications after this, these particular procedures? They're going to lay flat, pressure dressing, check the distal pulses, eyes and nose, check, that, check the uh, urinary output. So you're going to be doing Q15 minute vitals for an hour, then Q30 minutes for four hours, and then Q hour times two. You've got to watch uh, th their hemodynamic status very carefully post-procedure. You're also going to be observing their, their EKG, their cardiac rhythm, because sometimes hearts don't take too kindly to the fact that a catheter was threaded into them and dye was injected into them, and they decided they want to get a little dysrhythmic. So you want to watch that. And again, observing if they have for any reaction to the dye. Because if they've never had anything like this before, we don't know if they have an allergy to it. What do you think some of the complications can be after a, a procedure like this? Bleeding. What's that? Lost pulses. Renal failure. Acute renal failure. Fluid overload. Because if their heart isn't pumping adequately, then they can start retaining fluid. And you're flushing them, you're trying to get all that dye out of them, and you could put them into fluid overload. And if these fail, oh, here's the, I forget, the, I have the picture. Um, here's where they put the uh, balloon catheter into the coronary artery. There's the plaque. They inflate the balloon. And then um, they could actually insert the stent into this area, too, before they deflate and remove the balloon. But if that doesn't work, then they're going to have a, a cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft. And there's a lot of different procedures. Yes? The, the plaque will, oftentimes, if, if the, depending on the type of plaque, sometimes it'll just stay there. And, and the balloon just opens up the occluded artery. The problem is that if they don't change their diet and control their, you know, they're going to they're, they're gonna re-occlude based on, you know, on their diet and, and everything else. If the doctor feels that there's a chance that they might re-occlude too soon, uh, then they may put the stent in there. Or if they fear that there might be a, a, an arterial spasm as a reflex action to that uh, procedure, then they'll put a stent in there. Usually anticoagulants to prevent any blood clots forming. As with any kind of you know, open heart surgery, valve replacements, that sort of thing. Anything that's not natural and not naturally in the heart um, is always going to increase the risk of developing clots. So they're going to be on anticoagulants. Uh, they have several different types of cardiac bypass, uh, coronary artery bypass surgery. Um, the traditional is where they harvest veins from various parts of the body, usually the saphenous vein in the leg. Uh, but sometimes they can use the internal mammary artery or the radial artery. And they will suture it in so that it bypasses and, and restores blood flow around that area of occlusion that they were not able to fix uh, with an angioplasty. Uh, they can have up to six, vein, uh, six arteries uh, bypassed. So when you see that diagnosis, cabbage times three, it doesn't mean they've had the procedure three times. It means that they've had three arteries bypassed, or three areas of the artery bypassed. Uh, they can do it uh, traditionally. They put them on a cardiopulmonary bypass. They stop the heart. They, it's kind of like an ice, and they do all their procedures, and then they restore, and they shock it back into, um, uh, into function. Um, but they can now do the off, what they call off-pump, where they just slow down the heart rate uh, with hypothermia uh, to, the, to the point where it's beating so slowly that they're able to do the bypass on, basically on a beating heart. But it's a very slowly beating heart. And then they warm up the patient and um, bring them back to normal. Uh, Mid-cab is where they don't actually do a thoric thoracotomy incision you know, where they break through the sternum and spread the ribs. Um, they can actually go through 
uh, again, operating on a beating heart through a um, th thoracotomy incision rather than a sternal incision and bypass the blood vessels. Obviously, it's for, that would be done on something that's only like maybe one vessel and obviously an anterior um, occlusion that they can get at through the, stern, through, the thor, um, through the chest wall. So what do you think you're going to see on that patient <clears throat> that's had a um, cabbage? What did we talk about this morning? Chest tubes, mediastinal chest tubes, and maybe even some traditional chest tubes, depending on if there was any damage or, or problems with their lungs. Um, probably um, vasopressors that we're going to talk about next week when we talk about shock. Uh, hemodynamics that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, monitoring um, you know, their, their coronary function uh, through these invasive procedures. Uh, transfusions. And we need to really watch their electrolyte levels. Uh, patients who have had uh, coronary artery surgery, um, you know, will be getting a lot of fluids. They've had probably a lot of blood loss. Their electrolytes are out of balance. And we want to make sure that their, particularly potassium, is at a, an adequate level. And it doesn't get too low because if they become hypokalemic, they can develop dysrhythmias that, are, that can be fatal in a patient of this type. And we will talk a lot more about that when we talk about dysrhythmias. Uh, they're going to come back on a vent, usually for three to six hours post-procedure. And usually spend 24 hours in critical care before they go to a step down. What are some of the possible complications? Infection, bleeding. What's that? Arrhythmias. What? Cardiac tamponade. Those, those that mediastinal chest tube gets plugged and it's not draining the drainage out of the uh, mediastinum. You've got a problem with tamponade. Pulmonary embolus. Oh yeah, heart failure. So that's our patient with cabbage, that patient who comes in with chest pain or an MI, that the percutaneous coronary interventions did not work, the uh, angioplasty didn't work, the stents aren't working, the thrombolytics don't do the trick, then we have to get into the cabbage. Now we're going to talk about myocardial infarction. <clears throat> What's happening? What causes it? Right, the myocardium is not being perfused. There's an interruption of oxygenated blood flow to a part of the myocardium. And what happens to the myocardium? It dies. Because we have an infarction. We have death of, of heart cells, tissue, necrosis. And what are some of the causes of MI? We've talked about a few of them, but what else? We got CAD, we got uh, atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis. What other things can happen? about spasms of the arteries. Uh, patient takes a little bit too much of uh, some illegal drugs that cause extreme tachycardia. So anything, anything that decreases that blood supply, and if they have a very rapid heart rate because they've been sniffing too much cocaine, eventually diastole is so short that nothing's filling and no oxygenated blood is getting to the myocardium and we have an MI. Uh, the thing that you always have to think of when you're thinking about MIs, time is muscle. The sooner we intervene and restore blood flow to the myocardium, the less damage that patient's going to have. We can't necessarily reverse and heal that damage. I mean, if it's dead, it's dead. But we can prevent further necrosis and further damage the quicker we intervene on a patient that's having chest pain. And what we're going to see with an MI versus angina is what? What's the difference? Chest pain is chest pain, right? It's not being relieved by all the traditional methods of rest and nitrates. Um, none of that is helping. The chest pain continues and it gets worse. 
So the signs and symptoms, other than chest pain, what are we going to see if it's an MI? Radiation of the chest pain, diaphoresis. Patients will have nausea and vomiting frequently with this. Decrease urine output. Cool, clammy skin, pale skin, because they're not getting good cardiac output. So the periphery is getting a little, uh, la is losing perfusion. The feeling of impending doom. That patient who's having an MI, just like with a PE, is going to, you know, it's like, I feel like I'm going to die. Am I going to die? Tell me I'm not going to die. Yeah. Because that's, and that's one of the things that, that, what is different? Female patients with MIs oftentimes do not have the classic symptoms, fatigue, as she experienced. Uh, what else? Sh what's that? Jaw pain, shoulder pain. For, for women? For women? Like, like sometimes just a heartburn type feeling and shortness of breath. So they may not have the traditional radiating pain, jaw pain, you know, what we think of as the classic signs of an MI. And, uh, you know, and because you know, oftentimes women will tend to, you know, deny what they're going through anyway and, and oh, this it's no big deal, it's just a little heartburn. Um, so it can be very, um, uh, it can be, you know, very serious with, with women if they ha are not educated to the signs of, um, of uh, MI with them. You're going to see classic changes in the EKG based on where the MI happens to be. Now, it talks about this in the book, and we're going to I'm going to mention what they are, but it's going to mean a little bit more to you when we get into dysrhythmias later on. So um, everybody's aware of what the EKG looks like and what the waveforms are primarily, right? Okay, so and I am not an artist. We got the P, the Q, R, S, and the T. So certain things will happen with an MI, and they can tell what part of the heart has been damaged based on what's happened to those normal waves. So what does the T wave inversion mean? What does the book say? That means that the T wave, instead of being up above the isoelectric line, is dipping down below the isoelectric line. That means that there's ischemia. Somewhere in the coronary, in the, in the myocardium, there is ischemia. You have a T wave inversion. An ST segment elevation, that, that difference between where the S, uh, the S wave and the T wave is, that, that transition time, if it's above that isoelectric line, that, that normal line that you see on the EKG, that means that you have myocardial, myocardial injury. And if you have an abnormal Q wave, that means that there's not adequate depolarization. Depolarization means contraction of the ventricles in the atria. What did the echocardiogram tell you? Can tell you in, 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 it tells you what the, how the function is of your ventricles. It gives you your um, ejection fraction. It tells you how well the ventricles are contracting, how well the, the, uh, the walls of the ventricles are moving, how your valves are functioning. If you have incompetent valves so that oxygenated blood isn't getting out of the ventricles into the circulation, then, um, or it's backing up into the atria, then um, it will t that will tell you the, um, the echo. Has anybody gotten to see an echocardiogram? It's, very, it's fascinating. There's a, the, the uh, cardiac guy at, um, at Johnson, every time he comes up to do an echo, he drags all my students in there and, and does a little tutorial. Um, the poor patient I feel bad for because it probably takes him like three times as long to do their echo <clears throat> as it would be if he just popped in there and did it. We're also going to be looking at cardiac mar markers. And uh, first of all, we're going to talk about creatinine kinase, CK, and the isoenzymes. The problems with some of the cardiac markers is that they can be elevated in other problems other than an MI. And CK is one of those. 
because CK is that protein that's found in the brain, the myocardium, and the skeletal muscles. So if you're just looking at CK levels and not the isoenzyme for cardiac, then that patient could have, um, you know, a, a, a crush injury. Their CK is going to be elevated. They could have been struck by lightning. Their CK is going to be elevated. That's not going to be in necessarily a definitive confirmation of the fact that they have myocardial damage. So you have to look at the isoenzyme, the myocardial band, the CKMB. And that's, that's done as a, it's talked about as a percentage of the CK. If that is elevated, then that will be an indicative of myocardial damage. So what is the normal? Zero to three. Myoglobin, another one of those cardiac markers which can be elevated in other issues such as a crush injury or lightning strike or something like that. Um, it's found in both the cardiac and the skeletal muscles. So it will show some changes. It will, uh, the, the um, normal is 50 to 70. It will increase in one to three hours after an MI and it will peak within about 12 hours. But it's still not very specific for an MI but part of that cardiac panel. The one that's going to be specific for, for the MI is going to be troponin. If that is elevated, there's been myocardial damage. So that patient presenting with chest pain with an elevated troponin is probably 99.9% .9 of the time having an MI. If you have a patient with very, very severe congestive heart failure, their troponin might be slightly elevated just because of the fact that their, their, um, their heart, has, their heart muscle has failed and weakened to the point where it's actually releasing troponin into the bloodstream. But normally, any increase in troponin is indicative of necrosis, an acute MI, or other kind of damage to the myocardium. So that's going to be kind of the, the go-to cardiac marker that's going to really confirm with all the other tests that you're doing for that patient that they've had an MI. It will elevate very quickly. And it can stay elevated up to three weeks after the MI. Where, so that's that patient that comes in and has some blood work done and the doctor says, you had a silent MI. Because the troponin level in the patient, I never felt anything, I never felt sick. But now two weeks after th this episode, maybe I'm in the hospital for some other reason or you know, the cardiac status has deteriorated to the point where you know, they're feeling some symptoms and they go in there and they run all the tests and whoops, the troponin's elevated. They're not actively having an MI perhaps, but it's indicative of the fact that they did have some myocardial damage within the last three weeks. So our goals with managing the patient with an MI, we need to limit myocardial damage, we need to relieve the symptoms, we need to reduce cardiac workload because if the heart has to work hard, it's going to hurt because it's already, the muscle is weakened, and we need to minimize complications. So what kinds of things can we do to limit the damage to the myocardium? What? Oxygen? Right, we have to make sure that blood gets to that area that is dying, right? So even if we, we could pump them full of oxygen, if we don't do what, we're not going to improve we're not going to limit myocardial damage. What do we have to do? We've got to open up those coronary arteries somehow. So that's when we're going to give thrombolytics, when we're going to do a, an angioplasty, or even a bypass. If the patient is really in an acute situation where we have to just bring them right to the, to the OR and do a bypass, or they're not going to make it. So we have to restore perfusion to the myocardium first and foremost, because everything else that we do after that is going gonna, is gonna to get there. It's going to get where it's, where it's needed. So thrombolytics, anticoagulants. If we get into that, if, that um, if we get that patient within six hours of the initial incident, the onset of chest pain, then we can use those thrombolytics. Then we're going to relieve symptoms. That's when we're going to bring in Mona, our friend Mona. What does MONA stand for? Morphine, oxygen, nitrates, aspirin, or anticoagulants. 
So we have to give morphine because what does morphine do? Decreases pain, thereby decreasing anxiety, thereby slowing down and relaxing the patient so that they're not like pumping away like, oh my God, this is the worst pain I've ever had in my entire life. So that morphine is going to help to control their pain and that's going to help to eliminate, to eliminate those problems and, and further damage. Oxygen, obviously we got to get more oxygen to that damaged heart muscle. What do the nitrates do? They dilate the coronary arteries, helping to get more oxygen and blood flow to the myocardium. What do the ASA, what does the aspirin or the anticoagulants do? Prevent further clots from forming. So that's going to help relieve our symptoms, MONA. Now, how are we going to reduce cardiac workload? What kinds of things can we do to decrease the stress on the heart? Rest. Decrease ADLs, small meals, semi Fowler's position so that their airway can, their lungs can expand, they're not struggling to breathe, quiet, calm environment. And what kinds of medications can we give that would reduce the workload on the heart? Yep. Remember, sob, like you just bought a sob, not a Volvo, a sob. S-A-A-B. Statins. ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Aspirin. And beta blockers. The statins are going to prevent more plaque from forming. The ACE inhibitors or the ARBs are going to relax the blood vessels so that they can get more oxygenated blood. The aspirin is going to anticoagulate, prevent clots from forming. And the beta blockers are going to slow down and open up. All of this is going to help to improve perfusion and lessen the amount of afterload that the heart has to pump against. And if you add diuretics to that, you're going to reduce the preload, the amount of blood coming back to the heart from the rest of the body. Because if a lot of blood is coming back from the rest of the body, then that right ventricle has to stretch to accommodate it, and then it has to push really hard to get rid of it, and that increases workload. So if we can reduce that blood, that preload coming back to the heart, then we can reduce the workload of the heart. And then we're going to manage complications. Antidysrhythmics. Dysrhythmias are the leading cause of death in patients with MIs, usually because of electrolyte imbalances. Because if we have a decreased potassium, for example, that increases ventricular irritability, can push that patient into VTAC or VFib, and they'll die. That MI patient cannot tolerate a lot of ventricular irritability. The ventricle's already irritable just on its own without anything irritating it more. So watch that monitor. Make sure that you've got electrolytes in balance. Assess hemodynamics that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Pain control. and medications that are going to help to improve their blood pressure. Many patients who have had an MI, their cardiac output is so depleted that they need vasopressors to actually raise their blood pressure so they can get adequate cardiac output. So the patient is admitted to the ED after an episode of severe chest pain, scheduled for an angiography and possible PCTA. The nurse prepares the patient for the procedure explaining that it is used to determine whether there are any structural defects in the chambers of the heart, locate obstructions and administer thrombolytics, measure the amount of blood being pumped from the heart with each contraction, visualize coronary artery blockages and dilate any obstructed arteries.
does that. So 30% said locate obstructions that administer thrombolytics. 70% said visualize blockages and dilate obstructed arteries. What does this procedure do? Does it administer thrombolytics? No. No. It visualizes the blockages and um, opens any obstructed arteries. I'm going to get rid of this recording.